a special thanks to the organizers for taking the initiative to set up this very important and interesting meeting. I'm going to speak to you about some aspects, non-perturbative aspects of the cosmological principle, uh, kind of randomly chosen according to things I know and things I don't know. Let me start by just outlining what my basic assumptions are. Uh, can you see the, the heading assumptions there? It seems to be. We can see it. My, you can see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just, yeah. They're just obscured by my chat, the line with chat participants, etc. Okay. So first of all, uh, the matter content of the universe. We'll assume, or I will assume that baryons and cold dark matter have the same four velocity and can both be modeled as dust. So of course, this excludes very small scales with their shell crossing and the differences in the velocity. But when we're testing the cosmological principle, we're mainly working at large scales anyway. So I don't think that's a dramatic assumption. In terms of the dark energy, we typically just assume a cosmological constant, although many of the results will go through if you have dynamical dark energy that does not cluster or interact with dark matter. And finally, I'll assume general relativity. Many of the results will also go through to some forms of modified gravity, but I'm not going to complicate things by going into that. So when I say non-perturbative, I really mean background independent. And this is based on a covariant one plus three approach to general relativity, which was developed by Ehlers in the 1960s and, and his collaborators in the German school. And then taken forward by Hawking, who then stopped working on it, but more importantly by George Ellis, and also with an input from Christian and Sachs. So I'll refer to some of these works occasionally as we go, go along. Let me just highlight that other talks, such as those by Christos Tsagas, Asta Heinesen, and Chris Clarkson, will also make use of or mention aspects of this approach. So let me just briefly describe it. In this space-time picture here, we have our, the observer's world line with the four, four velocity of the observer. This would typically be one of the unique physical choices for a four velocity field to be co-moving with the, the matter. So we have fundamental observers. Here's the past light cone of the observer. This is the observable region. This is a constant time or constant ridge of surface. But the, the key point about the covariant one plus three approach is that at each point in space time, you split the space into a time axis, if you like, along the four velocity of your field. And then in the tangent space orthogonal to that, you have a projected covariant operator and a projected metric. Uh, and what we do is we can write the covariant derivative of the, of the fluid four velocity in terms of an expansion term, theta, an acceler a four acceleration term, A, a vorticity vector omega, which is the curl of UA, and the shear, which is the symmetric uh, covariant gradient of the four velocity. We then can define the Ricci tensor in terms of the Einstein equations. So we replace the Ricci tensor by the, the energy momentum tensor. And the energy momentum tensor is made up of the sum of matter, radiation, whatever else you might have. It has an energy density, a pressure, a momentum flux, and an anisotropic stress. Right, so far so obvious. But then the key point about this approach is that instead of directly decomposing Einstein's field equations, we use the Weyl tensor together with the Bianchi identities and the contracted Bianchi identities to operate as our evolution and constraint equations. So the evolution equations coming from these two equations here are equations for the time derivative of rho, where rho is the total rho, theta, Q, omega, sigma, and then the electric and magnetic parts of the vial tensor. 
And you can see already there are wave equations going on here. You can derive wave equations for the, the vial tensor, which correspond to gravitational radiation. And at the same time, we have a series of constraint equations which involve the divergence and curl of these uh, quantities. So I'm not expecting that you will look at all the details here, but just the, the basic structure, which is kind of Einstein Maxwell like using the, the vial tensor. And it, while it may look very complicated, it's useful when one is trying not to assume a background in cosmology and when it's trying to derive results which are independent of background. So let me first, before we go any further, just say something about the rest frames that we operate with. The matter rest frame is defined by the vanishing of the energy momentum of the moment, sorry, the momentum flux in the matter. So the energy momentum stress tensor for matter will be in the form rho u u, where u m a is the co-moving velocity of matter, the rest frame. And similarly for the CMB rest frame, we do the same for the radiation. It's the frame in which the, the momentum flux or the dipole of the radiation vanishes. And in this frame, the energy momentum tensor takes the form where there's a pressure term and an anisotropic stress term in general. So what about the cosmological principle? What, what does it actually mean? Well, to answer that is actually more difficult than one might think. First of all, the universe, as we know, is not exactly isotropic and homogeneous. At best, it's on average isotropic and homogeneous or statistically isotropic and homogeneous. And this implies on large enough scales, but the problem here is how do we actually average or coarse grain in nonlinear theory such as general relativity? How do we define an average in a way which is background independent? And as far as I know, that is an unsolved problem. And without solving that problem, we don't really have definitive answers to simple questions like, does exact isotropy and homogeneity imply perturbative isotropy and homogeneity? Does statistical isotropy and homogeneity imply perturbative isotropy and homogeneity? These fundamental questions are unresolved and they remain important, but we kind of just have to bypass them and work with what we have in, in the style of, of Alexei Starobinsky's approach, I think, and, and I support that. So the people who have gone into these issues of, of uh, averaging in GR includes principally George Ellis, Thomas Buchert, and others, including Chris Clarkson, who will be speaking later. I suppose I could say that in, in summary, even if we restrict ourselves to the observable universe, and, and uh, as, as Alexei Starobinsky was saying yesterday, these issues do not go away, they remain. So <laughs> the, the limits to the cosmological principle arise from the fact that we cannot directly observe homogeneity in any form, however we define it. Our past light cone, gives us access only to two spheres at constant time or constant redshift. So here, the, this two sphere here is not observed. Only that black one is observed. And here, the, so this one is outside our past light cone. Here, we do not observe this two sphere inside our past light cone. Our predecessors or our ancestors may have measured it, but we can't. We measure only this two sphere. So we do not have access to measurements on constant time or constant redshift surfaces, which is where homogeneity is defined. We need a Copernican principle if we want to deduce homogeneity from isotropy. This principle roughly says that we are typical observers. We're not at a special position. So statistically, what we see is statistically what others see. So what can we say purely on the basis of isotropy of the CMB. I'll start off talking about the CMB and then move to the matter distribution. It seems obvious that if the CMB is isotropic, then the geometry should be isotropic. But this is not true, not as far as I know. I don't know of any proof of that. And the basic reason is that we have to tie the matter into this, this scenario in order to actually deduce isotropic geometry from isotropic radiation. 
So that may not be an interesting, a very interesting or important matter. Um, let's move beyond that. Suppose we now add the Copernican principle and say that all observers in a region of space-time measure an isotropic CMB. It seems obvious that from this we should get Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker geometry. That actually it's not obvious at all. And we can't prove this by perturbative methods because we can't assume a background that we're trying to prove exists. We have to use the general fully nonlinear Einstein's Google equations. And that brings us back then to my earlier slides when I was outlining this nonlinear covariant approach, which allows us to do that. Let me just state the theorem or the result. It's, it's a combination of a series of results starting with Ehlers, Guerin and Sachs in 1968 and going into the, into the uh, early part of the century, earlier part of the century. And it's, it currently says the following. In a region, if dust observers measure collisionless radiation with vanishing dipole, quadrupole, and octopole, then the metric is Friedman in that region. This is an amazing result. We just need the first three multipoles beyond the monopole of the CMB to vanish in order to establish a Friedman or homogeneous geometry. And this is undoubtedly the best basis that we have for assuming exact homogeneity of the, of the universe. So it's an important result, even though it's, it doesn't refer to the real universe, it refers to the, the idealized background universe. So how would you actually, how do you actually prove this? Well, you start with the Louisville equation in an arbitrary space time. Uh, F is the distribution function of the photons and P is the full momentum of photons with, with their energy. We use the one plus three split with the four velocity here of the dust observers and E is just the unit direction orthogonal to U of the photon, of any photon. This four, four momentum of the photon is also the Planck constant time the, times the four wave vector. So we can ex split our distribution function in, instead of into spherical harmonics, which requires some kind of coordinates, we split into covariant harmonics using the E vectors here. So there's the monopole, the dipole, the quadrupole as an EA, EB. These are all trace-free spatial tensors. So they're orthogonal to U and they're trace free. The monopole gives me the energy density of the radiation. The dipole gives me the momentum flux. The quadrupole gives me the anisotropic stress. So the theorem's assumptions are the vanishing of the three first three multipoles, which implies the vanishing of Q, pi, and capital pi above here. So how does that get us to Robertson Walker? Well, it's, it's, it's quite a lengthy result, but I'll just outline the main steps for you because they're of some interest. The evolution of the quadrupole in the general space time, I didn't show this earlier in, in the equations that I gave um, because this comes from the Louisville equation. And it tells me that the pi dot of the anisotropic stresses evolution equation is sourced by various terms. You can see a whole lot of them here. And let's just go through one by one what, what we can get rid of. So this is in a general space time. Now we impose, first of all, our assumption that the dipole vanishes. That kills these two Q terms. The next step is to, to impose the assumption that the quadrupole vanishes. That gets rid of those terms. And then finally, the octopole vanishes. And you can see now that we have a shear term here and a shear term there, and it's easy to show that these two combine together and you project, you're projecting the shear with a trace-free tensor and a trace tensor, you get zero shear. And from then, using the fact that we have dust observers, we've got zero acceleration, the momentum conservation equation tells us that the spatial gradients of the energy, the radiation energy density vanish and the curl identity shows us that the vorticity vanishes. And basically this implies Friedman, Robertson, Walker. We also have to show that the vial tensors magnetic part vanishes, but um, electric and magnetic parts vanish. 
but that's that's quite straightforward. So that is how that theorem is proved. Um, just to note that the assumption of the theorem means that the matter rest frame coincides with the radiation rest frame. And of course, that's the basis of this test for looking at the dipole and the matter distribution. There's an open question, and that is, can this result be extended to nearly isotropic CMB implying a nearly Friedman universe? Well, the results proved by Stugo, myself, and Ellis in 95 required some assumptions on the derivatives of the multipoles. And it's still not clear what the, sta what the, the status of that possible removal of those conditions is. It's, there's been some work since then by Chris Clarkson and Suksu Rasanan and others, but this remains an open question essentially. So what about matter? Let's move from the CMB now to matter, which should be my main focus and I must be aware of time here. What about the general, what's the general scenario with the matter? With, without going into the technical details, I can say the following, that observations of on our past light cone at, can at most determine the geometry on the past light cone without field equations. So in fact, it's, it's quite interesting that the observations of, of, of galaxies, if you like, and, and the difference, the number counts, the distances, and the lensing of galaxies allow us to determine the geometry on the past light cone. In order to propagate that off the past light cone, we require field equations. So the GR field equations propagate off, but they propagate only to the interior of the past light cone. They cannot propagate to the future because you can have new data coming in, which leaves no imprint on your, in, on your past that can destroy your future predictions. So there's an interesting result. And a corollary to this is that observations cannot directly test GR or any modified gravity theory on cosmological scales without assuming the space-time geometry, basically because of this result. Well, what about isotropy? What can we say about the space-time if matter observations are isotropic? This result comes from um, the analysis which led to the previous general uh, discussion on the previous slide. The minimal set of observations that you need to prove isotropy on the light cone and isotropy of the geometry inside the light or inside the light cone and to the future of the light cone, if you assume that isotropy persists in time, gives me this following result. If one observer co-moving with matter sees isotropic angular diameter distances or luminosity distances, if you prefer, number counts, bulk velocities, and lensing in a dust universe with lambda, then the space-time is isotropic about the observer. And if all observers have the same isotropic measurements, then we get Friedman. In other words, if we use the Copernican principle. So that's sort of the matter um, partner, if you like, of the CMB result that I discussed. It's an observational basis for the cosmological principle using matter rather than the CMB. In fact, there's a more uh, powerful result. Roy, uh, may I yes. ask a question here? Sorry for the interruption. Uh, can we uh, restate the theorems that you proved uh, in terms of killing vectors? For example, can, can we classify this? Uh, I mean, for example, uh, isotropy or lack of it uh, in terms of number of killing vectors that space time admits? Uh, yes, if you assume, well, once you've proved the isotropy of the geometry, then you can introduce the killing vectors, yeah. But I think. Uh, the proof itself does not benefit from the concept of killing vectors, um, as far as I can think about it, yeah. Uh, I was just thinking about something like extension of uh, Bianchi classification hmm. to less isotropic, less homogeneous space time. Well, there are people who've looked at almost killing vectors, but I don't think that ever led anywhere. But perhaps we can come back to that in the discussion. 
Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. Right, uh, there we are. Sorry, a more powerful result, which in a sense is like a, an interesting parole, and it's, it's interestingly similar to the three multiples vanishing assumption. And it says the following, if you have in a dust region of a universe with lambda, if all fundamental observers measure isotropic distances to third order in redshift, so you don't have to be isotropic to all redshifts, only to third order in a redshift expansion, then the space time is Friedman. There's a beautiful result by Hasse and Perlick from 1999, um, then extended by Clarkson using a covariant proof and, and by myself and Clarkson a little bit ex further extended later. And Asta Heinesen has done more recent work on this and taken it quite a lot further. So she will probably mention this and, and take, it, take it further in her talk. This is a non-perturbative result, even though it's talking about an expansion in redshift, that, that is a non-perturbative result that gives, uh, that doesn't rely on any perturbation on any background space time, let's put it that way. And also note that if only one observer sees isotropic distances to third order in redshift, then you don't get isotropy around that observer. So it's, it's not a trivial result at all. It's, it's quite intriguing. The proof is, is quite involved, but I just want to show you some of the key ingredients. It actually uh, relies in the version that the Clarkson put forward, it relies on a covariant expansion, which follows the Christian Sachs 1966 paper, a real classic paper. Um, so if, if you expand the, if you expand the distance modulus in redshift, I mean, the details here are not so important, but the expansion can be written covariantly in terms of a wave vector, capital K, which is just the photon four vector divided by a, the scalar product at the observer. If you expand it up to third order in, in redshift, um, then you can define a covariant Hubble constant observed by a co-moving observer as the second contraction with the covariant derivative and a deceleration constant, which is effectively the covariant derivative, second covariant derivative of U triple contracted with K and normalized and then this minus three, just so that this thing reduces in Friedman space time to the standard deceleration parameter. So you can show then that the observed Hubble constant is the, gen the scalar part, the monopole, a dipole and a quadrupole. So it follows that a dipole and the Hubble constant, if we exclude scales where the dust model for matter breaks down is due to four acceleration. Note that because we've got co-moving observers, the, uh, the dipole and the energy momentum tensor vanishes. So it can't be due to that. The deceleration constant itself also has a dipole from, but from gradients of the expansion and from the divergence of the shear, because again, it can't be sourced by QA, which is zero. It also has an octopole, by the way, it has this term here. So this is quite an interesting expansion here, which uh, I won't go into the details of it, but it just reveals, it, it connects in a way with some of the dipole discussions that we've been having about the Hubble constant and the deceleration parameter, but it connects in a way that I'm not really sure of. So I'm not claiming that I have an answer. Um, I will end up with uh, a few comments about something which is not non-perturbative. And this is the dipole in the galaxy distribution. Um, so I'm just going to shift gear slightly to close off with some comments about the dipole in the, in the galaxy distribution, which are informed by a non-perturbative approach, but which actually rely on linear perturbations in the presentation I make here. The, the proper discussion of this topic has already been initiated by Sabir's talk yesterday. It will be taken further by Dominic's talk, uh, Seacrest and Scott and, and Ruth Dura's talk in the coming days. So. They, they're the people really to listen to. I just want to make a slightly different 
input here. And my input is to do with a redshift dependent dipole in the galaxy distribution. Typically, the work based on Ellison Baldwin and the work that was described by Sabir, for example, works with a two dimensional projection of the galaxy distribution on the sky. So I want to just show some work which asks what is the redshift dependent dipole if we do not project the galaxy distribution onto the sky. So if we have the boosted observer with a tilde and the CMB rest frame observer without the tilde, then this simple special relativistic transformation, we can take it because V0 is small, we can ignore terms of V0 squared. We have a transformation of the redshift due to this boost, a transformation of the direction and aberration term. These are well-known but interesting formulae. And if we use number conservation, and I'm talking about observed numbers here, I'm not using coordinates yet, so this is still covariant. The observed number per redshift per solid angle in the tilde frame is the same as the observed number times uh, per redshift per solid angle times the volume element. So the total number is conserved. And then we find that the the number per redshift per solid angle in the boosted frame is re related to the unboosted frame by this simple looking factor. But the relationship between the two Z's means that that three there is not, is, does not remain a three, it, it's, it is modified. So the dipole that's generated in the number density contrast is a function of Z times n dot v, v naught hat. Well, Moon, are you telling me that my time is up? Right. So, so mm -hmm. can you uh, miss, wrap oh, up yes, in I a couple can. of minutes? Yes, I can, certainly. So one can use the previous slide to, to, to show that this dipole factor here, the redshift dependent factor, is three, that three that you saw on the previous slide, then modified by a cosmological expansion factor a magnification bias term, an evolution bias term. So the evolution bias relates to the lumen, the, it has the luminosity function and a cumulative luminosity function. The evolution bias just tells you about the rate of mergers or the rate of destruction of galaxies, the deviation of the co-moving density of galaxy number from constancy. And the magnification bias just tells you the, um, the slope of the cumulative luminosity function at the magnitude cut. In the case of the CMB, DCMB is a constant, it's just V naught. So if you wanted to compare with the CMB, let's go to the angular power spectrum, the dipole of the boosted angular power is the intrinsic dipole plus the kinematic dipole. And, and Ruth will talk in much more detail about this. The kinematic dipole can be given by this expression here, two D factors, so you can actually cross correlate and you can auto correlate. And if we look at the auto correlation of this dipole relative to the CMB dipole, you can see that in principle it can be much bigger and is redshift dependent. But of course, doing, doing it in redshift slices is likely to face quite a lot of problems from shot noise, so we can project this into two dimensions by using the projection, the integral of the boosted number counts with redshift to give us the angular boosted number counts and then get a projected two dimensional dipole. This is work in progress and I, I can't tell you what the outcome is yet, but I'm, I'm going to try and connect this to existing work on two dimensional dipoles. But my take home message here is that we should be looking beyond just the radio galaxies to, to other galaxy redshift surveys in the future uh, in order to really probe the matter dipole in a consistent way. And with that, I will stop. Okay, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. So I think some very short question uh, for um, or most of the other questions, we can just uh, postpone at the end. So, okay, so we have a, a, a two or three, four, okay, so many. I don't remember the number, but uh, by looking, so, oh, Ms. Howe, oh, so, okay, oh, yeah. Ms. Howe, can you make us some 
Yeah, very, very short question. I have lost somewhere. I mean, in the beginning, you uh, have say formulate everything in a very general way, non product, and then you introduce isotropy and so on somewhere. Now, but the, the probably the, the last part of you know all these formulas, you're talking about very general space time. Is that is that right? I mean, I get confused. Uh, do Sorry. you hear me? I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. sorry. Now, I, now, I can, you hear me? Are you talking about this? Oh no! Oh no! no. I, I, I just, just a bit lost. I mean, so you, you talked about isotropy, and uh, and then, then you talked about two frames, you know, CMD frame, matter frame, and so on, so on. And then hmm. uh, towards the end of your talk, you started to discuss all these formulas, you know, general. Kind of looks covariant formulas for uh, redshift, Hubble parameter, deceleration, ah, and so on. Ah, oh, okay. Just you know, without any assumptions of isotropy or anything. Oh, oh yes, yes. Thank you. Now I understand. Yes, these equations that I showed you here are in a completely general space time. Okay. There's no right. assumption. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe I didn't make that clear enough. That's also quite remarkable. That's a completely general space time. And this is the paper of 1966 by Christian and Sachs. They did exactly this, although they didn't have this result of Hasse and Perlick, but they were making these kind of redshift expansions in a totally general space time or general dust space time. Yeah, it's general if it's dust. And if you add lambda, it's, it still works. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, so George Smoot, I, I hope your uh, question is also short and the short answer. I'm embarrassed to say that I missed the first part of the talk because I was busy having breakfast and it was dark out and I didn't realize it was nine o'clock. But if I understood you were saying you were saying that the C and B can only be used on the light cone, and I would say in your calculations, you might consider the following situation, which we have in reality. That is, you have a very large number of photons coming. Those photons, I get to choose one in 10,000 of them. So 10 to the seventh or something and in the line of sight and, and interact them with a local thing like a Sanjay Zaldovich cluster or a larger fraction to interact them by gravitational lensing, adjusting their polarization so that I have a, a way to separate the phenomena. Then I could have high statistics over a large volume interior to the light cone, right? I can't go beyond the beginning of the light cone, but I can cover segments inside the light cone all the way to the present day. I'm sorry. Did... Yes. Yes, George, sorry. I, I was just flipping through this to my extra slide. Right. Which, which confirm what you're saying. Right. And so, um, in fact, the Sonia Zodovich effect allows you to look at the isotropy yeah, in exactly. other locations and the gravitational lensing combined with polarization measurements in, in, in the seven years of combined polarization would allow you to make measurements at, at slices inside of the light cone. Absolutely. And I would have presented that if I had more time. So I've just gone to one of my extra slides here and you're quite right. <laughs> All right. So I, I shield for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank so you. for uh, the remaining two questions, uh, Dominic and uh, Mohamed, I'd like to uh, ask some uh, favor. Could you? Uh, uh, is it okay uh, if you ask at the end of the session um, at the six o'clock? Okay. Thank you. And also the Mohamed, uh, is it okay? Mohamed. Sure, yeah. Uh, end okay, of the... thank you. Thank you for the understanding. And then, then let's move on to the next presentation by Ashok Singhal. So, uh, can you share the screen? Ashok Singhal is going to uh, present us our pe uh, peculiar motion from the Hubble diagram. So, Ashok? Hello? Yes. You... Uh, could, could you share the screen? Uh, okay, uh, I may have to share it, so just a minute.
Is it visible screen? Now, yeah, we can see it. Yes. Maybe you can okay. make it full screen. I'll, I'll make it full, yeah. Is it okay? Okay, very good. Okay, why don't you uh, start? Yeah. Uh, well, this is the title of my talk where I'm going to talk the, uh, on the Hubble diagram of supernova 1A and uh, its implication for the cosmological principle. Now, of course, we all know cosmological principle says the universe to a co-moving observer should appear isotropic without any preferred actions. However, a peculiar motion of the solar system that is observer it might introduce a dipole anisotropy in some of the observed properties of the cosmos. Now, the peculiar motion of the solar system has been determined by CMBR, Cosmical Background Edition, and it gave a velocity 370 km per second along certain direction. Now, uh, in last 10 years or so, many AGN surveys have been used to determine the dipole from these AGNs. Uh, idea was to check whether they checked with the CMBR result, but uh, surprising the results have been quite different. Like NVSS, NRO VLA Sky Survey, which comprises 1.8 million radio sources, it has shown a dipole asymmetry, which gives a velocity about four times the CMBR value, something like 1600 kilometer per second, instead of 370 kilometer per second. Then after the TIFR GMRT Sky Survey, uh, TGSS, which contains 0.6 million sources, and it also showed a very significant dipole anisotropy. In fact, this anisotropy turned out to be about 10 times the CMBR value. So this is coming to be different from NVSS. That was quite uh, confusing as well as surprising. Same way, dr 12 q sample of about uh, 100,000 quasars has shown a redshift dipole with a velocity which is six times the CMBR value. Now, the surprising thing about this is, I will come back to this. The magnitude of the CMBR and AGN dipoles differ from each other quite by a factor of four to 10. And recent uh, by Subir Sarkar and uh, group, they have found factor of two in one uh, survey. But in almost all these cases, in fact, why almost? In all these cases, the direction seems to be the same as that of the CMBR dipole, which is very surprising. In fact, if the direction was also coming randomly in different directions in sky, then one would have said, okay, okay all these, there's something wrong in all the surveys, maybe in the analysis and the survey are uh, some maybe computer program. However, when all of them, give the same direction, that means there is something curious and intrinsically there is something there. Uh, just to show you, this is the uh, result from NVSS survey and TGSS survey. And uh, this is the dipole from that. And the dipole expected from the CMBR is this on this scale. But NVSS is coming about four times and this is coming almost about 10 times than the CMBR survey. And there are quite a lot of points and they're consistently falling. And then another survey of mid-infrared AGNs, which also shows a factor of four to five higher than the CMBR. CMBR is here, while this AGN survey shows something like 2000 kilometer per second. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, okay, this is just to show the uh, position in sky. The, here, the dipole is somewhere here, while the CMBR direction is here, this circle, uh, point circle, while the NVSS is coming to be somewhere here. In the next TGS dipole, the T here shows the uh, direction of the TGS dipole, while the NVSS is again here. Now, this is quite surprising that the magnitudes are same, but the directions are coming different. Then is there some other way to, I mean, we have done an uh, AGNs, but is there some other way to find the peculiar motion of the observer or the solar system? 
then I just thought of this, that uh, even supernova 1A can give us a peculiar motion from their Hubble diagram. Of course, supernova 1A, their numbers are small, something like 1,000, and they are not uh, like complete survey uh, in the sense that all uh, sources are all supernovas in certain direction of sky are known because they just happen and uh, observations are not uh, like radio sources where we can say okay, we know all the sources above certain flux density limit in uh, certain direction of the sky. Same cannot be said about supernova. However, apparently the Hubble diagram of supernova can eat uh, some sort of peculiar velocity of the observer. The, uh, these two formulas, which are of course well known, this is the redshift observed but see the redshift cosmological and is this the peculiar motion of the observer, then the observed redshift by the observer will be this. Same way the magnitude, if this was the magnitude, if there was no peculiar motion, M0 is that, you can say cosmological, then this magnitude will also change. Now these two diagram, if uh, these two formulas, if are used together, one can get a handle on the peculiar velocity of the observer. Uh, what happens is, uh, okay, I'll come back to this. Uh, suppose this is the lambda CDM model of uh, redshift versus the magnitude for supernova, it's broad. Okay, now if you have a peculiar motion of the observer, let's assume it is P here is the number of time the CMBR motion. P is one is same as CMBR motion. P zero is of course no peculiar motion. P is equal to five here I have used just to demonstrate it. Then if P is five, then the source here will move towards left. This is if you are in the same hemisphere in which the dipole direction lies, a pole direction lies of the motion. If the source lies in the upward direction of the are in the antipole direction, then due to peculiar motion, the source is redshift and magnitude will shift like this. Of course, if you go to higher redshift, the movement or shifting of the points becomes smaller and smaller. So then all the sources which are, let's say in the forward hemisphere, that the hemisphere in which the source lies, uh, in which the motion of the observer lies, all those will shift in magnitude, which will be weaker actually, high value of MB but that is weaker, while all the sources in the opposite direction, which is opposite hemisphere, backward hemisphere, they'll move this way and they'll lie below this. So at this had redshift of 0 0.6, it's a 0 0.06, sorry. Uh, and if P is five, then this can result in a systematic magnitude difference of 0.5 between the source, which is at the apex of the motion and the source, which is in the backward direction. I have just explained here that if peculiar velocity is V of the observer, then different sources, depending upon their angle theta in sky, will get differently displaced in this Hubble plot. Now, all sources in which cos theta is greater than zero, that is theta lies between zero and 90, let's say that is hemisphere sigma one, uh, they, all of them, will move in one direction while all the sources which are in the other hemisphere, they'll move in the other direction as I was showing in this diagram. So this can give a systematic shift in the sources which are in one hemisphere versus in the other hemisphere. So what all one has to do is assume a direction, let's say CMB direction, the dipole you take, and then calculate the average magnitude at a given redshift for sources in one hemisphere versus the every redshift or source in the other hemisphere and compare them. Like this is again just a diagram of uh, these are the supernova which I have used in my sample and they are about 614 supernova 1A. And this is the uh, line, uh, this thick line or continuous line is for the lambda CDM model with these values. And if there's a shift, uh, if there's a uh, peculiar velocity, P, then different values of P, the sources will lie on this dotted line or 
which is for the forward hemisphere and on the dashed line which is in the backward hemisphere so one can compare the actual uh, observations and get a handle on p p is, which is the motion of the uh, piccolo velocity of the observer now here i had used lambda cdm model but actually even a straight line makes a very good fit to the data which makes life easy and easy to handle and what matters here is this displacement and this displacement is more or less independent of the modern cosmological model used to relate red shift and the magnitude because this depend mostly on the velocity piccolo velocity of the observer and the angle at which the source lies with respect to the dipole of the direction now so i took all these 614 dipoles uh, 614 supernovas and divided them in two hemispheres and then i plotted them and then you find that for zero uh, theta zero to 90 degrees uh, that is forward hemisphere all the sources fit into this line where the sources between 90 to 180 that is backward hemisphere that is uh, opposite to our antipole direction they seem to be coming here this difference between these two will be proportional to the piccolo velocity. Of course, there will be errors, uh, uh, statistical uncertainty, but that one can work out. Now, from this, I uh, now uh, suppose uh, the action I take to be CMB action, but uh, I want to determine the direction also. So what I do is I randomly divide the sky into about 10,000 points, two degree by two degree, and take the direction of the dipole in that direction and make similar diagram as this and find at uh, let's say some low end of red shift at 0.06 i because at lower red shift the uh, this displacement uh, shifting is maximum of course i cannot go below very low red shifts because then the local motion will uh, local bulk motion will affect my observations so i, I have restricted to a red shift of 0 0.06 here and then for different action in sky, I find this uh, displacement in the uh, two curves. Uh, one is in the hemisphere, uh, forward hemisphere, one in the backward hemisphere. And I have plotted them here. The maximum difference seems to be coming at around here, okay? Which is uh, right as 173 and decision 10 degree. Just, just for a comparison, the CMBR dipole is here, 168 minus 10 degree here. So it's not too away, uh, too far. In fact, this is the one sigma errors on this, and these are two sigma errors. So this like just a two sigma error. I mean, the difference between the two. And these are just contour plots of uh, decreasing uh, difference between the two. Also from this, one can actually calculate what should be uh, for different P values, uh, you can plot what you should be getting these dotted lines are showing this and this actual data from the observations okay uh, along the direction and it does seem to fit something above four maybe 4.3 4.2 which is in fact very similar to what was observed from nvss which was around four of course uh, tgss gave a value which was quite different so around this direction then the dipole of supernova lies um, peculiar motion determined from supernova seems to determine in this direction seem to be in this direction which is about two sigma error bars from the cmbr and the motion seems to be 4.2 times now in this i have plotted various dipoles observed like uh, nvss is this n tgs is t this is from dr 12k 12q this is redshift this is a redshift dipole also has been observed and this is from uh, Myra AGN sources, and this is from supernova. Now these are directions, and this is the uh, in the center. Uh, the so with smaller errors, almost no errors, is the CMBR dipole direction. So these dipole directions seem to be sort of within about two sigma of the CMBR. In fact, these three seem to be falling within one sigma of that. So it does seem that. Uh, the dipoles direction of the poles of various dipoles, AGNs or even supernova, they seem to be 
the same direction as the CMDR dipole. However, their amplitudes differ by almost an order of magnitude, anything from two to 10. However, common direction for all these dipoles determined for completely independent surveys by different groups or different using different programs does indicate that these dipoles are not merely due to some systematics in the observations or in data analysis, and there's something genuine in that direction. And it does not fit in the, what you call, peculiar velocity model, because peculiar velocity should be one value. That is a motion of the solar system or that is observable in the solar system, respect to the average universe. But that, that cannot vary on, on the what uh, uh, source they use, whether AGN, the supernova, or CMBR. So it does show that, uh, that there is something is peculiar or curious in the universe, that this direction may have something. It may not be really peculiar motion. I mean, I can neither rule it out nor I can support it. That that there is something special in this direction, which is direction also determined by CMBR dipole and also by other dipoles, but it does not seem to fit in the peculiar motion of the solar system or peculiar motion of the observer because the values coming are very different, almost order of magnitude difference. I don't know whether to call it some sort of cosmic direction, preferred cosmic direction like axis. Okay, uh, this is too strong a word, but I'm just throwing it. That that does mean that the data from these dipoles is in conflict with the cosmological principle, which of course we all know is cornerstone of the modern cosmology. So that's all. I'll stop here. Thanks for the nice presentation. So are there any some questions? We have some uh, time for the questions and comments. One more? Yes, okay. So there's a question in Q&A. So if you open the Q&A. Ah, I see, so I didn't see it. So, okay, so so you have a question right yeah actually more a comment than anything ashok thanks for the talk um we had some discussion this morning basically on the cmb dipole direction and how it basically crops up in a whole load of different like the, so for example the cmb dipole it appears in a whole load of a well not a whole load but at least two anomalies in the cmb and um, one was this uh, parity asymmetry um so basically that seemed to be tracking the cosmic dipole and the other was basically the alignment of, uh, I guess, the quadrupole and the octopole and their normals being aligned with the cosmic dipole. So, and, and just to point out that Damien Hudson-Meckers also seems to have something in, uh, in uh, quasar polarizations that are also picking up this direction. At least there seems to be an axis. And Damien, I guess, is gonna talk about that a bit later on. But yeah, so there seems to be a lot going on for a direction that should be just some sort of Doppler effect or, you know, basically it should be just due to, it should be a special direction in our universe that just defines our motion, right? Um, yeah. it, it's certainly very intriguing, just, just at the level of coincidences. Yeah, it is very intriguing on why, why all these directions should be coming similar. But uh, I don't know, and magnitudes coming very different is even more intriguing, but that could be we are on a wrong, uh, we are thinking wrong that we are trying to ascribe all this to, to including CMBR, we are trying to say that this is all to do peculiar motion of the solar system, but maybe there is something else that maybe these individual surveys, or individual sources have some peculiar anisotropy in that direction, which is genuine anisotropy, why it's different, I don't know but uh, it may have something to do with the direction as some peculiarity. Okay, so then uh, Tamara Davis. Okay, so you have a question? Thanks, yes. Um, I'm one, uh, one possibility that would make all of these things align and certainly for this particular sample uh, is the heliocentric correction. So if that's done with the additive formula like the low redshift um, approximation, then that can give you some issues and will potentially show a dipole where there isn't one. And I have, I'm 
going to apologize for my own part in presenting data that has this problem in it. Um, but a lot of the supernova data um, has used that low redshift approximation for the dipole. In fact, we're going through the data at the moment and hopefully have a paper coming out in a month or so that will uh, give new redshifts for all of the supernovae that we have, uh, which will, um, which um, does the heliocentric correction um, correctly. So I'll talk about this a little bit in my talk tomorrow, but that is a potential cause of some, uh, some issues. I know, for example, if, if you have ever used redshifts from NED, then that also has a problem with the, the heliocentric corrections and that goes up linearly with redshift. So it makes it worse for high redshift samples. So I will talk oh. about that a little bit tomorrow. By, by heliocentric correction, do you mean going from the Earth's frame to the heliocentric frame or going from the heliocentric frame to the CMB frame? Sorry, good point. Going from heliocentric to CMB. But um, all of these tests that Singhal mentioned are about the consistency of the latter interpretation. So it's not relevant. As in, you don't want to do this test after correcting for this motion. The CMB frame doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. Okay, so we can uh, continue the discussion in the uh, uh, later uh, discussion session. And uh, well, let me just ask, uh, ask Wider Raman for the question. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, thanks for the talk, Ashok. Uh, I just by chance, I haven't uh, read your paper on this a few months ago when it came out in the archive, and I had a few questions there. Yeah. Um, so on your on your slide where you had the the supernovae systematic shifts and you had different values of p from like one to five, um, um, if I'm not misunderstanding, say p because five corresponds to a CMB value of five times the uh, uh, peculiar rusty value of five times the CMB value. Um, so I guess uh, it's another yes, slide four, a bit four, earlier. Four point three five. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a bit earlier. There's another slide. Where, yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, this one doesn't actually have the, the peak with one to five markings, but when I read the paper, it said uh, it assumes the data has no systematic other systematic shifts um, because you're measuring systematic shifts to your, to your own solar dipole. And I think it's actually maybe one more slide earlier. Uh, we have another similar chart. Um, yeah, this one, yeah. And so you can see the difference between P equals one and five is of the order of like half a magnitude. Yeah, uh, yeah, also, and the, yeah. Yeah, and in the in the same paper, you overlay the JLA of the Pantheon, and you show that the systematic difference distribution the data, and it's also around half a magnitude or one magnitude. So it seems to me there is systematics in the data, and if you don't separate that component out, you'll get your values confused with that. Um, does that yeah, sort of make sense? Uh, one thing is that uh, the, the difference in the data in the two uh, samples seems to be at larger redshifts, so point six. Yeah, yeah. So, but here uh, it's a point zero six uh, half the magnitude, where the two samples sort of coincide. Although I'm not using uh, a second sample, so true, true. That's very true. I'll, I'll more just. Uh... Um, under the impression that at low redshift there are systematics available, and I guess since the methodology depend on the fact there are no other systematics, uh, is there anything you're doing to potentially separate out these other systematics? Uh, I I don't think so. Of course, uh, uh, many more surveys are coming, much larger number which will test it. But here, idea is to just uh, introduce the idea that uh, from Hubble diagram. Okay one can determine the peak exactly. velocity. Okay, uh, and at least from the existing data, uh, which uh, seems to be used even for uh, cosmology from supernova and all that, that data shows that peak velocity is not just one as a 370 km per second. And if we use this peak velocity, which seems to be four to five in this case, I mean, P is four to five times the CMBR, then, in fact, all of our uh, results will have to rethink on uh, the uh, interpretation of uh, coming out of uh, supernova data that the universe is accelerating and all that. 
I mean, I, I will not say anything much more on that. But at least it raised doubts on that. That uh, have we oh, yeah. correctly yeah. used the peculiar motion of the observer or solar system in that area? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we can we can leave yeah. all the other questions to the end of this session. And uh, thanks again, uh, Ashok uh, Singhal. So let me yes. move. Uh, let us move on to the next presentation by uh, Dominic Schwartz. Uh, Dominic, could you sh uh, share the screen? Okay, great. Uh, okay, uh, so Dominic is going to give uh, present us uh, the cosmic radio dipole. So can you make it a full screen then? Okay, good. Oh, you can start. Oops. Okay, great. So you can start. You're muted, Dominic. Okay, good. Uh, sorry, yeah, my... The, the window for unmute disappeared, so sorry. I... Okay, now. Good, Thanks okay, great. For... Yeah, so now it works, right? Yes, everything is good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for organizing this nice uh, workshop. Um, yeah, so I will would like to talk a little bit about in, in detail about what we know about the cosmic radio dipoles and um, also a bit of what would be the next steps. So uh, I did not do all of this stuff alone. So um, I listed some of my collaborators and uh, I'm currently heavily involved in LOFA surveys and uh, I don't show results from LOFA yet, but uh, we hope that we will soon have uh, the next generation results uh, with LOFA surveys on, on this issue. Um, so I'm still convinced that if we look at the sky at large, um, it's still isotropic. And uh, so because if we would throw this away completely, then I would not know how to do my cosmology lecture anymore. Um, so I, what I wanted to remind you in this slide is that I think we are talking here about a few percent effects. We are not talking about the order one uh, picture of the universe. And I think that's always important to keep in mind. Um, but of course, um, the leading dipole feature on the sky uh, that is known since many years is of course the CMB dipole. Um, but if you just look at the CMB dipole alone, um, it's just an assumption that this is explained by proper motion of the solar system. Um, you need to test that assumption. And uh, some people, uh, the, the, the CMB community did this test by looking also at the higher multiple moments. Um, and that these tests turns out to be turn out to be consistent with the uh, kinematic interpretation, but uh, don't produce a measurement that is as precise as if you just infer a velocity from the CMB dipole itself. So, but I was uh, kind of triggered uh, to look into the dipoles uh, by an observation that we did. Uh, almost 20 years back uh, when we looked at the WMAP uh, results, and we studied the low multiple moments. I guess that Dragan uh, also talked about that this morning. Um, and I think Owen uh, just uh, mentioned it before. Uh, there is an alignment between the quadrupole and octopole directions and the dipole. And uh, there is also this parity asymmetry uh, that is also kind of normal to the uh, dipole. Um, so that triggered my interest in, in, in trying to better understand uh, whether the dipole is really just a proper motion of the sun. And um, since that time, I'm, I'm just, uh, this is one of my key research questions, so to say. 
So I think uh, Subi yesterday and uh, already uh, introduced very nicely uh, why do we actually also expect a cosmic radio dipole. Uh, so this is the famous paper of Alice and Baldwin uh, where people, uh, where they showed that uh, both the Doppler boost of the radio frequencies and the aberration of the source positions uh, give a reason that if you have, a, um, if, even if you start with a perfectly isotropic distribution of sources on the sky. And this is not restricted to the radio, of course. This holds for any frequency, but uh, the, the application to a power law flux distribution is, of course, best in radio. But um, you could also go to any other um, frequency uh, and, and do the same test. And of course, so we should have this kinematic contribution on a dipole, but there is also clear that we have structure in the universe, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And therefore, um, we also do expect some structure dipole. So you can, of course, then make predictions on how big should the structure dipole be, and that needs a model. So in, in, the, in our best fit cosmology model, uh, which is the lambda cold dark matter model, we can run simulation and ask ourselves, so what is the kind of average dipole we would expect uh, on uh, large scales, and that turns out to be actually the expectation is to be well below the kinematic dipole. There can always be a local contribution to the dipole, say local, I mean the local 100 megaparsec or whatever, uh, which is of course beyond the regime where you can make a statistical prediction. Um, this is just a tiny fraction of the Hubble patch and, and, and rare things can happen if you just uh, sit in one piece of, of the universe, right? Um, so this local contribution actually must be measured. Uh, it's hard to predict. And, and uh, I mean, the cosmic variance of, of what you measure locally at your spot is rather large, right? Um, and of course, there's short noise and there's systematics. So we have to try to control all of, all of these things to get a proper understanding of what's going on. Um, and I think I don't need to really repeat this a lot. Um, uh, the basic idea on, on why to do this is to check if there is actually a universal rest frame, whether the rest frame that we infer from the CMB is the same rest frame that also others would infer. And, and by comparing our motion to uh, radio galaxies that are spread over a quite large patch in the universe, um, we, we define kind of the meta rest frame uh, and can then compare that meta rest frame with the uh, CMB rest frame. And so why radio? Um, of course, it's good because there is no dust extinction. Um, then uh, radio sources are visible through extremely high redshifts. Um, stars that can pollute infrared and optical surveys are typically quite dim in the radio. And uh, we have very different systematics uh, in radio compared to optical and infrared. And so that's a good uh, complement to those other surveys. OK, so let me just go through. We, we studied a lot. Uh, what is the best method to, to measure um, dipoles and uh, went through linear estimators in detail and quadratic estimators in detail. We also looked at the question whether we should work in angular space or in harmonic space. And there are certain advantages and disadvantages for all these methods. But just in order to figure out what is in principle possible, um, here on the right hand side, you see uh, simulations, uh, 100 simulated skies uh, that have a radio dipole. Um, and then you use different numbers of sources to uh, try to estimate uh, how accurate you can reconstruct the direction of the dipole. And you see, in order to get accuracies that are at the degree level, you need to go to the 10 to the 7 objects. If you want to, if you're happy with plus minus five to five degrees or so, 10 to the six objects are good. If the current level of, of uh, accuracy is 10 to the five objects typically, and you get um, errors of the order of 
12 to 15 degrees or something like this. So that's the kind of precision compared to the CMB dipole precision. This is, of course, nothing. Um, but uh, with next generation surveys, we will get uh, close. Um, OK, so before I show you results, this is from a forecasting exercise uh, that we did for the uh, square kilometer array surveys. Um, so on this map, you see the following. So first of all, we simulated um, a structure dipole, uh, which gives the pink dots. So this can point anywhere on the sky, right? Uh, the blue dot uh, is the CMB dipole. And then you add in the kinematic effect. And then if you just combine the structure dipole plus the kinematic dipole, what you expect is then, uh, so this is uh, 100 different simulations, right? Um, you expect the purple points. And then, so you see the combination of structure dipole plus uh, the kinematic effect gives some scatter and you don't expect to recover in this two-dimensional projection uh, exactly what the CMB dipole is, even if it would be just the standard story, right? Um, but you can, if you had a chance to uh, remove the local sources um, up to a redshift of something like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, um, then you get the distribution of the red dots. And this is so this would allow you a relatively precise uh, measurement of the direction. And in the histogram on the right hand side, you also see how good would you be to uh, re, uh, to, rest, uh, to, to infer the, the uh, amplitude and, and velocity. And you see, in principle, this method should work. And um, so now we let's have a look at, at how it works in, in practice. So we looked uh, in a recent work that was published early this year. Uh, we compare uh, the four biggest wide area um, surveys that are available um, and that have kind of homogeneous uh, completeness levels, which is the NVSS, the SUMS, uh, Sydney University Molonglo uh, Sky Survey, the Westerbork Northern Sky Survey, and the DGSS. So NVSS and DGSS were quite already mentioned before. Um, and I show you here on the right hand side what the uh, number counts, how they look as a function of flux density. Um, and uh, so you see that at some point um, all these surveys become incomplete. So when these, uh, for instance, when the red crosses start to drop down or when the black crosses start to drop down, this is the point where the survey is incomplete and you should no longer trust the survey at all. Uh, so you want to stay away a little bit from the from the regime where you uh, where you come to this incompleteness. So you would put uh, flux thresholds uh, on the surveys to um, get homogeneous conditions across the sky. So um, so here you see the maps. So on the left, uh, so so what is different about these surveys is that they spread quite different frequencies in radio. So the NVSS is the highest frequency at 1.4 gigahertz. SAMS is at 843 megahertz. WENS is at 325 megahertz. And the DGSS is at 147 megahertz. Um, so this is just a central frequency. Of course, they all have a frequency band. Um, and they have different uh, sky coverage. They have different. Um, number of sources, source densities. So the largest ones are the TGSS and the NVSS. And so what we did, so on the, on the left-hand side, I show uh, pixel counts um, with all the sources in the catalog. So you see there is a kind of lots of artifacts. Uh, there is a step in sensitivity in zooms. There is a prominent feature from the galaxy in NVSS. Um, there's also some holes in the DGSS and so on. So you put a mask on these things to uh, get rid of the, of the bad regions and you put, put a flux threshold and then you end up with the uh, right hand side plot. We also then uh, produced further masks that were using uh, the noise structures of the surveys and, and tried to um, 
get rid of the most noisy regions and so on. And then you uh, measure uh, using a quadratic estimator uh, in real space uh, or in angular space, right? Uh, the uh, dipole, and we find very consistent directions, uh, as Ashok uh, was already uh, explaining in his talk. Um, so for the right ascension, TGSS and NVSS give more or less exactly the same result. Uh, the declination also agrees very well. Um, declination of the other two surveys also agrees extremely well. However, the right ascensions of the smaller surveys is not so well defined and has much larger error bars just because of the lack of sky coverage, I guess. But um, if you compare it in the last, last row of the table, uh, you, I, have, I give here the, the coordinates of the CMB dipole, and you see uh, within, within two sigma, everything agrees. Uh, most things agree within one sigma. However, this situation changes drastically if we look at the amplitude of the dipole. Uh, so the expected uh, dipole in the radio surveys would be of the order of uh, 10 times, uh, no, sorry, five times uh, 10 to minus three. Uh, but what we actually find is a value of two times 10 to minus two uh, to six times 10 to minus two. Um, and uh, as you see, as you go from higher to smaller frequencies, uh, in general, the, the amplitudes tend to agree. So we, we looked at this in a bit more detail. And uh, so this is just the results. So um, on, on the dipole amplitudes as a function of the uh, survey frequency, and just an empirical fit where we just uh, fitted uh, a power law uh, between those things. And as a comparison, I also show the simulations that include, uh, so, so there is an expected bias in the dipole amplitude, but the expected bias is much smaller than the expected uh, signal that we see, right? So um, all the understood, biases and, and uh, systematics uh, we have put into the simulation. And these understood biases and systematics cannot explain uh, the dipole excess. Um, so then we asked ourselves, OK, what's, what's going on? Uh, why, why can it be that the DGSS and the NVSS give the same answer in direction? but a very different answer in amplitude. So we generated a, a catalog uh, that, that had only cross mesh sources. So we are sure that all of the sources in this new catalog are in both catalogs, right? So that means um, the sky position must be the same, otherwise they wouldn't be in the catalog, right? Um, so the only thing that can differ in the two uh, catalogs is the fluxes of the sources. And um, the interesting thing is if you take that sample and you take a flux cut on the TGSS in the combined, so, so you take the TGSS flux cut from that set of combined of, of, of sources that are in both catalogs, you get the red uh, measurement for the amplitude. If you get a flux cut uh, on NVSS, fluxes, then you get the uh, green uh, measurement. And if you take a flux cut, um, that is kind of, um, if you take a flux cut on both the TGSS and NVSS flux, and then you plot that at the geometric mean frequency, then you get something in between. So this a bit hard to understand what's really going on here, because uh, at first sight, this seems to be impossible that you get such a thing, right? Um, so you could ask yourself um, whether there is something wrong uh, in, in, in the survey, but you could also ask, could there be a physical reason that, that the two are different? And in principle, there could be a physical reason, namely, um, most of these objects that we probe are AGNs. Um, and the AGNs in, in radio typically have a core 
And then many of these AGNs show jets and, and lobes. And uh, both the NVSS and the TGSS have not very high uh, angular resolution. So you cannot really uh, uh, know where, where the radiation comes from. And we know that at high frequencies, um, cores typically have, no, so, sorry, cores typically have flat spectra, whereas lobes typically have steep spectra. So it could well be that the flux that comes from the core is not, uh, sorry, the flux that is seen by NVSS is dominantly from the core, while the flux that is seen in DGSS is dominantly from the uh, lobes of the radio sources. So perhaps they are not sitting on the same power law. Uh, even so, um, if you just do a statistic, uh, fit, you, you find, find that uh, you can all do uh, fit the power law there. Uh, but, but this is something that one needs to go into more detail and uh, needs to study, I guess. Okay, so that's the status of the radio dipole. So we see with all four surveys, we see the same direction, but we see uh, different amplitudes. Uh, so if you just face the results, then the radio dipole seems to be chromatic. It's interesting that this also agrees very nicely, uh, especially the NBSS result with these catwise quasars uh, that uh, uh, we will hear, hear about. I think it was tomorrow, the talk, and, and which uh, Subia already um, mentioned. Okay, so what could be wrong? Um, I think one of the most suspicious things is the flux density calibration, because that's highly non trivial, and we definitely have to improve the systematics and the understanding of those. Um, and I think it can be the different angular resolution and um, these kind of things. Uh, so, but let me just uh, go on. So, um, so what do we know about the nature of these radio sources? Um, here on the left, I show you uh, the differential source counts now uh, uh, normalized to a Euclidean universe. Um, and which are from, from LOFA uh, surveys. So these red points are the uh, differential source counts of uh, the data release two of the LOFA two meter sky survey that is currently under preparation. Um, and uh, the black line comes from the uh, LOFA deep fields, which is already published. And what you can clearly see that there's two types of population, right? So we have one source population that describes this and then would go down here. And then we have a second population that kicks in here and then uh, eventually would also go down here. Uh, so, and the interpretation is that this is largely AGNs, whereas this second population are star forming galaxies. And um, this is also something that is currently under preparation for publication. Um, so we have, in the deep fields, we have photometric redshifts for 95% of all the uh, LOFA sources, uh, which is based on PENSTAS data, Spitzer data, and, and a few other things. Um, and you really, so we really know that our objects uh, peak at, at large. Uh, so, so this is these, these four, these three uh, thresholds. Uh, these lines that I put here. This is where the NVSS survey would sit, right? Um, so, so we are talking here about much deeper surveys than NVSS or TGSS. Um, and you see that there is there's this contribution from AGNs at quite high redshifts. And then there is uh, some star forming galaxies that kick in uh, at lower redshifts. Um, so, Maybe similar to what uh, Roy just explained. So this gives this will give, give us a chance to do a dipole tomography. So uh, we already started to think about what we can do about uh, with, with a tomographic dipole uh, some years back. Uh, here we did it not as a function of redshift, but as a function of flux density limit and frequency. And you see that, so in this simulation, what we did is we assumed that you have an isotropic universe 
and you cut out a hundred megaparsec sized void. And we just wanted to study what is the effect of that void if we assume that there is really a mix of populations of AGNs and, and star forming galaxies. And this actually leads, this gives rise to non trivial effects, like uh, even, even just a single void and the mix of two populations gives you a dipole that would have an evolving uh, amplitude in dipole and frequency dependent dipole, right? Uh, so this particular simulation cannot explain the situation that we see. You also look at the magnitude here. The effect of such a dipole is way too small to explain what we see. Um, but I think it's a type of, of things we have to study in more details and, and get a, a better handle on to, to see what's going on. So let me just quickly um, talk about the next steps. So we are currently preparing or, or uh, preparing a suite of three different surveys in, in LOFA. One is the LOFA two meter sky survey, which sits here. So this is the uh, NVSS. This is the EMU survey that is prepared by ASCAP right now. Um, this is the TGSS here. So what you see here is frequency and this is sensitivity, right? Um, this, then this is the low, for, um, low frequency sky survey and this is the low for decameter sky survey. And uh, so this will cover eventually the full northern sky. This will cover everything north of declination 24 and this will cover everything north of declination 30, roughly. Um, and so we, so far, we released this yellow piece of the uh, lot survey. We are about to release everything that is in the black uh, region here, uh, which will contain 4.5 million radio sources. And, um, and then eventually, in a, a few years' time, we will hopefully cover the full sky. So you see, this will be very powerful probes to, to improve these tests. You see, this is just extrapolating with a power law of uh, 0.8. Uh, so you see, we will go, even with this survey, we will go deeper than NVSS. Um, this survey will. So, so this multi-frequency question, we will be able to answer by just extending the frequency span uh, over more than, so, so we, with EMU and these three surveys, we will have actually more, almost two decades covered in frequency, so which will be very good uh, to get a handle on what's going on. So um, my preliminary conclusion is, um, that the observed meta dipole is not dominated by a kinematic dipole because that should be frequency independent. Um, and the meta dipole is large, meaning a few percent, right? Uh, and that could either be due to something that is large at a rather local scale, or that is of, of percent moderate size on a cosmic scale. And uh, we need this type of tomography that Roy was um, pointing out uh, to figure out which is the right answer, right? And I think one aspect is here that also we should not forget that the CMB dipole could have a non-kinematic contribution. And I guess I stop here. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Dominic. So uh, we have a, a question. Uh, let me just take uh, one question at this moment by Mohamed Ramiz. Uh, could you? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I actually I I raised my hand when you brought up the question of the clustering dipole, but later you spoke about whether this uh, frame exists and whether you can do redshift tomography, et cetera. And uh, you have also now uh, spoken about this local scale dipole. And my question is this, even if it is just out to 100 megaparsecs, if, if the matter distribution is anisotropic and we detect this to an extent that we know it is a real feature, then is it, for, is it justifiable to keep doing the FLRW assumption uh, 
after that because you know yesterday also during one of the discussions you had asked somebody uh, is there a reason to go beyond the newtonian perturbed flrw model um so yeah. maybe, maybe we mean, can do this in the discussion session because it's a kind of generic question that also affects i think other people's views okay uh Okay, you have, you have any some short comments, uh, Dominic, then we can postpone uh, uh, everything to the discussion session. Is I okay? think, I mean, my, my short comment would be just, yes, it's a good question and I don't know the answer, right? <laughs> okay, okay, for the remaining, so let's uh, postpone to uh, uh, the discussion session and then let's uh, uh, move on to the next presentation by Christos Zagas. So, Christos, yes. could you share the yes screen? Yes, thank you. I will do that, but uh, in order to improve my audio, I have to switch off my camera, unfortunately. Well, uh, so I'll do that and then try to share the screen. Thank you. I hope you can hear me better now. Oh. We don't see anything yet. Yeah. 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 You will hopefully. Uh, here we are. All right. Okay. Seems to be yes. We see yes. Uh, okay. Maybe full screen better. Ah, uh, that's right. Is it better now? Right. Uh, perfect. Could, uh, why don't we start? All right. Well, uh, good day to all of you there. Um, or good afternoon or good morning, depending on the time zone, I suppose. And thanks very much to the organizers for uh, the invitation. So what I would like to, to discuss with you is uh, tilted cosmological models. In other words, models that uh, allow for uh, two uh, relatively moving families of observers. And uh, the motivation is to look at the implications of large scale peculiar motions. Um, so we know that uh, the Milky Way and the local group are moving with respect to what we call uh, the smooth uh, Hubble expansion. We believe that at least some part of the CMB dipole that we see is uh, because of this uh, relative motion. And in general, uh, there have been uh, many observations talking about large scale peculiar motions in the universe. So it's probably fair to say that no real observer in the universe follows uh, the Hubble flow and only fictitious or idealized observers uh, do so. Uh, nevertheless, despite this widespread presence of uh, uh, peculiar motions, um, not many theoretical cosmological studies uh, take them into account. And when they do so, the analysis is usually Newtonian, and it's usually done also in the, in the Hubble frame of the idealized observers. Uh, so we'll try to uh, change the perspective uh, a little bit. So employ general relativity, which means consider these tilted cosmological models, and also take the point of view of the real observers, uh, that move relative to the Hubble flow and look into their kinematics and compare uh, the kinematics of the real observers to the kinematics of the Hubble flow, the idealized observers, and see whether the relative motion effects can actually uh, interfere with the interpretation that these two families give to the universe, to the cosmological data, as uh, we this way, and focus on the deceleration parameter. So that's how we describe uh, relative motions or peculiar velocities in relativity. We introduced uh, two uh, four velocity fields, one for each family of observers. And uh, this now will be uh, our reference for velocity field. And this will correspond to the Hubble flow observers. And this will be uh, the uh, tilted uh, for velocity field. That's the tilt angle uh, uh, beta here. Uh, corresponds to the uh, uh, real observers that have some peculiar velocity with respect to the Hubble flow. And of course, when you introduce two four velocity fields, you have two temporal directions in your space time. Uh, and of course, you have two spatial sections orthogonal to each one of these uh, four velocity fields. So, like I said, 
we will employ a tilted model. We will assume that it is almost FRW, uh, and we will assume that it contains uh, low density, low energy uh, dust uh, baryons or cold dark matter. Uh, and we will use a linear relativistic cosmological perturbation theory. And like I said, take the point of view of the real observers. So the large scale peculiar velocities that we will try to take into account in this uh, analysis. So we believe that they are a recent addition to the kinematics of the universe after recombination triggered by structure formation. Um, and these are the so-called bulk flows. So they have typical sizes of few hundred megaparsecs and uh, speeds of a uh, few hundred kilometers per second. And I would like, there are also extreme bulk flows that have been reported in the literature. These are the so-called dark flows, uh, very large, much larger and much faster. Now, this is a controversial issue. I'm not going to use uh, data from uh, these dark flows in the rest of my talk, but I thought of mentioning them uh, for, uh, for completeness, uh, if nothing else. Um, so this is another diagram here. That region D here is the, uh, the bulk uh, flow, and there are here that two typical observers inside this bulk flow, and they have this uh, peculiar velocity with respect to the Hubble expansion identified with this UA field. And when the peculiar velocities are non relativistic, the relation between these three velocity fields is this simple uh, reduced uh, Lorentz boost. So once we have two temporal directions and two spatial sections in this, uh, this space-time because of the two families of observers, we need to define the associated, uh, the corresponding differential operators. So we will use an overdot to define time derivatives in the Hubble frame and the prime uh, to do the same in the uh, bulk flow frame. And this is the covariant derivative operator spatial in the Hubble frame. And this one is in the uh, tilted frame, the bulk flow frame. And from now on, wherever you, whenever you see this tilde on top of a variable, this means that it has been evaluated in the bulk flow frame. Uh, now, all the kinematical information is in the gradient of the four velocity fields. And this is what Roy presented uh, in the beginning of this session. So that's how it splits into theta, sigma, omega, and uh, capital A. And these are the expansion scalar. When positive, we have expansion. When negative, we have contraction. Uh, the shear, shape distortions, the vorticity, rotation, and the four acceleration tells you whether there are in action non-gravitational forces or whether the, the world lines of the observers are non-geodesics. And of course, we are in an expanding universe, so this uh, theta is positive always. And it is related to the Hubble parameter through this simple expression. And of course, there is similar decomposition for the four velocity of the bulk flow with the corresponding theta, sigmas, omegas, and capital A's. And again, this tilde theta is positive since we are in an expanding model. And um, of course, you can do the same decomposition, or oh, sorry, an analogous decomposition uh, for the peculiar velocity field as seen by observers in the bulk flow. And you get this var theta, the var sigma, and the var pi. And this is the uh, peculiar volume expansion or contraction uh, scalar. That's the peculiar shear and the peculiar uh, vorticity. And uh, depending on the sign of this var theta, which can be either positive or negative, uh, we have local expansion or contraction. So when var theta is positive, this region here, the bulk flow, uh, expands, increases. When it's negative, it shrinks, it contracts. Uh, and I, as I said, although the capital theta is always positive, this small theta can be uh, either positive or negative. Now, these three uh, velocity fields are related. Uh, and when the peculiar motions are non relativistic, the relations are quite simple. And they look like that. And you can see that there's difference always. So the the variables measured, uh, measured in one frame are different from the variables uh, measured in the other frame. And the difference is always due to relative motion effects. OK. Uh, now, this one tells you that the expansion rates measured in the two frames are different. Uh, and this one tells you that even for some reason, the four acceleration vanishes in one frame. In any other frame that moves relative to that, 
it will be non-zero just because of relative motion effects. And assuming that you can set the four acceleration to zero, you can choose which frame you can do that. Uh, <clears throat> here we'll take the point of view of the uh, bulk flow observers. So we're gonna set the four acceleration to zero in the Hubble frame. Uh, and in that case, uh, you have in the tilted frame an effective for acceleration, so effective non-gravitational forces, if you prefer, just because of relative motion effects. Uh, of course, you can do the opposite or the reverse. You can set the for acceleration to zero in the tilted frame. And in that case, you have no zero for acceleration in the Hubble frame. At the end of the day, there is no difference, no matter which frame you decide to choose to uh, do your study. Now, although there is shear and vorticity in our analysis, uh, we won't use these expressions because they don't get involved in the calculations that, that follow. So the key relations here is this, that tells you that gives you the difference in the expansion rates between the two observers. And this one that tells you that there is an effective for acceleration in one of these frames. Now, similar uh, relations uh, hold between uh, the mother variables. So that's the, form, uh, the energy momentum tensor uh, in the Hubble frame, and that's how it splits in the tilted frame, in the bulk flow frame. And rho, p, q, and pi are the density, the pressure, isotropic, the energy flux, and the viscosity in the two frames. And again, these are related. And at the linear level, the relations are simple. So you see there is no difference between the two frames for the density, the pressure, either isotropic or anisotropic, but there is a difference uh, between the flux vectors. Again, just because of relative motion effects. And again, you can, assuming that you can set the flux to zero in one frame, you can choose which frame to do so. Uh, and here we will set the flux in the Hubble frame. And because we assume no pressure, this means that these are now the relations in the tilted frame. And here there is an effective flux just because of relative motion effects. So, even if the Hubble flow observer sees the, the mother of the universe as a perfect fluid, the other one sees it as imperfect just because of their relative motion. And as I said before, uh, you can reverse this assumption. You can set to zero uh, the tilted Q, and then you have a non-zero Q just because of relative motion effects. So this is another relation that we will use next. So let's go now to the mean kinematics of the bulk, which are uh, described by these colors. So this is the relation between the expansion rates at the linear level. And of course, at the linear regime, this ratio is much less than one. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the expansion rate measured by the bulk flow observer is either uh, larger or smaller than the expansion rate measured in the Hubble flow, which you can say is the expansion rate of the universe, depending on whether the bulk flow is locally expanding or contracting. And if you uh, differentiate this expression with respect to time, you come up with this one. Uh, and you see again that there is a difference just because of relative motion effects. So if the thetas are different between the two frames and the derivative is the same, uh, then the deceleration parameters measured in the two frames should be different as well. Uh, and this is the deceleration parameter defined in the Hubble frame, and this is the one in the bulk flow frame. And that's the linear relation between the two. So as you can see, the deceleration parameters measured in the two frames are different. And the correction term is because of relative motion effects here, because you see that if there's no peculiar velocity, this var theta goes to zero and all this term goes away. So the question is how large this correction can be. And as you can see, it depends on uh, the time derivative of uh, the, the local expansion or contraction uh, scalar. So we need an expression for theta prime. So we need, um, the Rechiduri equation of the peculiar motion, the peculiar Rechiduri equation. And this is available in the literature, uh, nonlinear expression. And if you linearize it around the background that we have assumed, that's how it looks. And this is the source term. So it is, this is the three divergence of the time derivative of the peculiar velocity, this red term. So now we need an expression for this quantity. And we can get it if we appeal to a relativistic, sorry, cosmological perturbation theory. And in particular to the equation that describes inhomogeneities, the evolution of inhomogeneities in the density. And that's the one. Uh, it's nonlinear expression is also available in the literature. So what you do is you linearize this expression or the nonlinear expression 
in the tilted frame. Okay, this quantity, like I said, describes spatial variations in the uh, distribution of the matter. This does the same for uh, the overall expansion. And these are the flux terms. And they appear because in the tilted frame, uh, there is an effective flux uh, due to relative motion effect. So the, the, the fluid, the cosmic medium appears uh, imperfect. Um, so what you do is you substitute the effective flux back into the evolution equation. You take the three divergence and then you solve for the red term up here. And that's what you get. And there is a Laplacian here, spatial Laplacian uh, term, which implies scale dependence. And you can see this scale dependence, you can make it explicit by using a single Fourier decomposition for your perturbed variables. And that's how then the peculiar Rechuduri equation looks like. And this is the scale dependence that I mentioned before. That's the Hubble uh, radius, and that's the scale of the peculiar velocity perturbation. Uh, squared. And uh, this is uh, the homogeneous term, uh, the, sorry, the inhomogeneity term that I mentioned before, multiplied by this difference, one minus omega. And we know from observations that this uh, difference is uh, very small, perhaps much smaller than this uh, 10 to the minus two. So on these grounds, we will ignore the blue term from now on. And then if we divide theta prime with h dot, that's how the, the ratio looks like. Okay. And again, we here you see this scale dependence here. Um, and you remember now, you might remember that this ratio of the derivatives is the one uh, that determines the difference between the two deceleration parameters. Here is the ratio. So if this ratio is scale dependent, then the difference between these two Qs is also scale dependent. And uh, that's how it looks like, okay. Uh, and of course, always in the linear regime, this ratio of theta over h is much smaller than one, but this ratio, the scale ratio can be large. So we have some first uh, qualitative results here. And it tells you that if you go to very large scales near the horizon or larger, then the correction term here is negligible and the two deceleration parameters coincide. So what the Hubble flow observer measures and the bulk flow observer measures uh, doesn't make any difference, uh, which is expected because you, we anticipate that on, as you move out to progressively larger scales, uh, the impact of peculiar motions should fade away. But if you go inside the horizon, um, that's how the relation between the two cues looks like. And you can see that the overall effect of the correction term here, the red term, also depends on the sign of theta. In other words, on whether the bulk flow is locally expanding or contract. And if it is expanding, if this bulk theta is positive, then Q tilde is larger than Q. So uh, the deceleration parameter measured in the bulk flow frame is larger than that in the Hubble frame or than that of the universe. But if it is negative, it is smaller. So the, the question now is uh, how strong this correction term can be. And you can see from this expression that it will dominate the right-hand side of this equation uh, when it becomes equal to uh, Q, the value of the deceleration parameter in the Hubble frame. So by uh, solving this equation, this one, you can come up with a critical length defined by this expression here. Uh, lambda t. So on scales below, inside this critical length, uh, the relative, the peculiar velocities dominate over the background expansion as far as this relation is concerned, at least. Okay. Uh, so perhaps some of them may have uh, seen the analogy between this critical length and another one that also derives from uh, linear perturbation theory. And that's the gene's length. And that's how it looks. Okay. This is the sound speed divided by the uh, speed of light. And as you can see, in both cases, we have uh, the critical length is a fraction of uh, the Hubble scale, a small one, because this ratio is small and this is also small. And uh, recall that the, the, the gene's length marks the threshold below which uh, 
pressure gradient perturbations dominate over the background gravitational pull and dictate the linear evolution of uh, the local linear evolution of uh, density perturbations. Here it is peculiar velocities that dominate over the background Hubble expansion and dictate uh, the local bulk flow uh, kinematics. Um, so the question now is how large this uh, critical length can be. But before we actually go there, uh, we will take this definition, plug it into the relation, back into the relation between the two deceleration parameters, which looks like that, simplifies and looks like that. Uh, where the plus sign corresponds to locally expanding bulk flows and the minus to locally contracting. And you can see from this one, this expression, that um, assuming that you are on scales smaller than the critical length where uh, the, uh, the relative motion effects dominate, uh, and assuming that your bulk flow is locally expanding, then <clears throat> the deceleration parameter in the bulk flow frame will be uh, twice as large as the deceleration parameter uh, in the Hubble frame perhaps large. So there we have an apparent over decelerated expansion for these observers. But if you are in a uh, contracting bulk flow within this critical length again, then the deceleration parameter turns negative. And there there is an impression of accelerated expansion. Now, in the latter case, uh, the critical length uh, also marks the transition scale where the, the sign of the deceleration parameter changes from positive uh, to negative. And you can see all these things in this simple diagram where we have simplified things. We have assumed that Q in the Hubble frame is half and that theta, uh, the local volume scalar, is constant throughout the bulk flow. Okay, and uh, this solid line corresponds to a locally uh, contracting bulk flow and the dashed one to an expanding. And you can see that on, and this is the critical length, this should have been a T instead of P. Um, and you can see that on very large scales, uh, there is no real impact from the peculiar motion. The deceleration parameters coincide with the one in the Hubble frame. But uh, as you go to smaller scales, if you are in an expanding bulk flow, it becomes more and more positive. If you are in a contracting, it drops, it crosses the zero threshold at the critical length, the transition scale, and then keeps dropping. And somewhere here, there is a nonlinear cutoff because the linear uh, analysis breaks down and nonlinear effects need to be taken into account. Okay. Um, so the question now is to get some numbers uh, to see how, uh, what is the, what values can we get for the deceleration parameter in the, in the tilted frame and for the critical length, the transition scale. And to do that, uh, we need to know theta, uh, this local expansion or contraction scalar. And we cannot get it from observations as far as I know anyway. So we'll use some simple uh, basic dimensional analysis arguments and say that this is the divergence of the peculiar velocity. So we will say that it is uh, the ratio, the ratio between uh, the mean peculiar velocity reported in the bulk flow surveys on certain scales divided by the scale. And if we take this estimate and we plug it into these relations, the one for Q, Q tilde, and the one for the critical length, uh, or the transition scale, that's how they look. And now where VH is the, the Hubble velocity on the scale, the reported scale. And now you can go to some of the surveys. So this is a, an indicative uh, list. And use the scales that they report, the velocities that they report and get the values for Q plus, and Q minus. This is for expanding and this is for contracting back flows and for the critical length, the transition scale. And you can see that if it is locally expanding the bulk flow, the value of Q in there is always uh, more than one, though here only marginally. If it is contracting, it's always negative, although here only marginally again. And the transition scale is always larger than the scale, the reported scale, although again here is only marginally. Okay. Uh, so if I will summarize, uh, there are some qualitative results as far as uh, bulk flows are concerned on peculiar, uh, large scale peculiar motions, that they can increase or decrease the local value of the deceleration parameter. They can increase it if the bulk flow is expanding locally, decrease it if the bulk flow is contracting locally. And in a more quantitative uh, manner, 
the relative motion effects because of the peculiar motion introduce a characteristic length scale, the transition scale. And if the bulk flow is expanding on scales where uh, the peculiar uh, motion effects dominate, we have an over deceleration, uh, local over deceleration because Q there is larger than twice uh, Q in the uh, Hubble frame. But if it is contracting, then within this range, we have local acceleration uh, because there are the deceleration parameter turns negative. In either case, the effect is local, but the affected scales are large enough, can be large enough uh, to make it look uh, as a recent global uh, event. Okay. So schematically, we can probably see it like that. Suppose that consider now only the case of contracting uh, bulk flows, locally contracting. Suppose that there is an observer here at the center of the bulk flow with this peculiar velocity with respect to the Hubble flow. And this is the corresponding uh, uh, transition scale. Suppose that corresponds to some redshift uh, ZT. Now within this region, the deceleration parameter is negative, outside is positive. So um, for this observer, uh, this observer sees the deceleration parameter to become less and less negative as the redshift increases. It turns, it becomes zero uh, at uh, ZT and then starts becoming positive and eventually approaches uh, its Hubble flow, Hubble frame actually, uh, value on sufficiently high redshifts, as you can see down here. So it is fairly easy for this unsuspecting observer to, to misinterpret this local change in the sign of the deceleration parameter as a global, recent global acceleration. So he might think that the universe started accelerating at this particular redshift. Um, so in, other, in, in a way, this observer here he has misinterpreted his, the, the local contraction of the bulk flow that he resides in as an acceleration of the surrounding universe. So one perhaps intuitive way to imagine this is imagine this observer as a passenger sitting in the back of a car and the car driving in a big motorway and all the cars are driving at the same speed. And then without the observer, the passenger actually noticing his car or their car slows down. But he thinks that the rest of the cars have accelerated away. So that's more or less one way of imagining it. So is it, uh, assuming that there is no uh, natural bias on these scales, cosmological scales in favor of contracting or expanding bulk flows, the chances for an observer to reside in one of them should be something like this. Uh, which means that nearly half of the observers in the universe may believe that their cosmos is over decelerated uh, doing local measurements. And the other half will think that the cosmos is under decelerated and some of them may actually think that it is accelerated. So is there any way for these unsuspecting observers to uh, find out that they have been merely experiencing a, an illusion? There should be a way and the answer should be somewhere in the data. So what they should look for is the trademark signature of relative motion. And that should be uh, a an apparent dipole anisotropy in the uh, acceleration. So the uh, deceleration parameter measured locally by these observers should be more negative in one direction uh, in the sky and equally less negative in the opposite. Or if you want, uh, the universe should appear to accelerate faster uh, towards one point in the celestial sphere and equally uh, slower in the, in the antipodal. Moreover, this axis in the distribution of the deceleration parameter should not lie very far away from the CMB dipole, assuming that they are both triggered by relative motion effects. Um, now, over the last 10 years or so, there have been some reports in the literature that such an axis might actually exist in the, in the data. Um, as far as I remember, the first time I saw it was in a paper by Cook and Linda Bell about 10 years ago. Uh, but they attributed to coincidence. More recently, Colan et al. Uh, reported a similar dipole, but, and they actually related it to uh, relative motion effects and Subir uh, uh, made some comments yesterday. 
And of course, uh, Costas Mingas uh, has reported a dipole in the, in the Hubble parameter. And since these two parameters, the Hubble parameter and the deceleration parameter are directly related, if there is a dipole in one, there should be a dipole in the other as well, uh, although not of the same magnitude. So <clears throat> we might be able in the future to uh, tell whether these uh, anisotropies actually exist, uh, confirmed beyond any doubt, and if then uh, we have to wait. Um, thanks very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christos. So let's move on to the question and discussion session. Uh, first, uh, Dominic Schwartz, you have a question, right? Uh, turn on the yes. mic, yes. Yeah, 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 so I have a question, yes. Uh, nice talk, uh, Christos. Um, I wonder, I mean, the reason why people kind of easily accepted an accelerating universe uh, 20 years back was because there was an age crisis before, uh, just before uh, the supernova observations were published. So in your tilted universe, would that also affect our clocks? So I mean, even so, so if I understand what you say correctly, you could imagine that the acceleration is only local, and there is no acceleration on a global scale. But wouldn't that throw us back to the age problem? Uh, assuming that there is actually an age problem, because as far as I know, you're referring to uh, the age of the I mean, universe you, with respect to the age the... of the globular clusters, I suppose. Yeah, if you just take the oldest objects that we know about in the universe, mm -hmm. which is about 12 to 13 giga years, right? Mm -hmm. And then you, you just take the, the Hubble rate and you, yeah, you, you just take an Einstein de Sitter model, then it just does not work out, right? Um, that's possible. This can be a problem. I don't say no, but as far as I know, uh, Calculating the age of the globular clusters is not a, a, a done issue. I think there are also uh, issues that need to be resolved fully. Um, so I'm not sure that we can uh, use this as a, a very serious argument. Uh, perhaps but it there is. There are also other, other things. I mean, like, like uh, radiative decay series uh, in, in old stars and things like this. Um, perhaps, yeah, I'm not uh, disputing these uh, comments, but my analysis looks uh, specifically on the effects of relative motion on the mean kinematics and the deceleration parameter. Uh, whether there are problems coming from other observations, there might be, uh, but observations change. We no, for no, sure, sure. But I mean, the question to you would be, whether you could imagine that this would also have a, a large enough effect on clocks, so to say, a local clock compared to a mm. clock that is outside the bulk flow, right? If, mm. if those I see, I see, no, large I, enough, I see, then, I see what you mean. Then maybe this is then the age problem might not be a problem, right? I see what you mean. Sorry, I didn't get it right the first time. Um, the honest answer is that I don't, I cannot answer this question right now. Uh, maybe no, yes, maybe no. I cannot really give you a straight answer. But okay. it is an interesting, it is an interesting uh, angle. It's an interesting angle. Thank you. Okay, uh, David. Uh, David will show you. So you have a question. Oh, please turn on the microphone. All right. So, so I was going to ask a similar question to. Uh, Dominic's last question, um, and in particular, what happens when you integrate your um, your local boost over the age of the universe? Um, but I, I guess that's partly also related to how you define the Hubble frame, and it's not really clear how the Hubble frame is defined um, and, and why. And what what's the origin? Uh, of the difference between the two frames and the particular scales in the problem? Um, I assume that there is a reference frame in the universe, uh, which you may call it Hubble, CMB, or something else, uh, relative to which uh, you can define and measure peculiar velocities. 
Otherwise, you cannot do that. But even if you forget about the Hubble frame, um, and this is just two uh, observers moving relative to each other, um, then what this analysis tells you is that they will one will measure one thing for the generation parameter, and the other observer will measure the complete opposite. So the question is, which one are you going to believe? So you don't need actually to introduce a Hubble frame to do this analysis. You can say that you have two observers in the universe out of the million, billion, zillion observers that exist, and they move relative to each other. And you ask, how do they measure? What do they measure? as deceleration parameter. And you see that it can be completely different. And then you ask, which one is right? Okay. So uh, in my opinion, what this analysis tells you is that if you want to get a good idea about the global kinematics of the universe, you need to go to very high redshifts in order to make sure that you are not contaminated by relative motion effects. The point is, how far out you need to go. And this tells you that according to the observations and the reports of peculiar velocity, uh, peculiar velocities, you might have to go quite far away. So I think that's the, that's the, the basic message. Sorry, Chris, this is, if I can just jump in, we have a dipole in, in quasars as standard candles. Mm. And our quasars begin at 0.7. They go from 0.7 to 1.7 and 0.7 all the way to, let's say, 7.5. So it's extremely deep and there seems to be an emergent dipole in H0. Right. So it's it, it, like, it, so it, it, I mean, I don't think this fits into your local picture. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, I'm not talking about that dipole. I'm talking about the deceleration parameter here. I mean, the analysis is focused on one particular uh, kinematical aspect. Um, if it is related to the dipole, if it has any effect on this dipole that you are uh, reporting, I don't really know. It's a different analysis. You have to do a different analysis in order to uh, answer the question that you're asking. So, okay, Shayan, then don't let. Uh, okay, so the, it's a follow-up on Ons and Dominic's question. Uh, I was just wondering what, if your analysis has any implications for the uh, Hubble tension and the value that we report as uh, uh, H0. Probably, well, in principle, you might use something like that uh, to uh, check the, the Hubble tension problem. But the effect uh, on the Hubble parameter is, it seems to be smaller than the effect on the deceleration parameter. And this has to do with the fact that the, uh, the Hubble parameter is the first derivative of the scale factor and the deceleration parameter is the second derivative. So as you increase the order of uh, the differentiation, uh, the relative motion effects become more and more important, uh, stronger if you want. Uh, so you might see an effect on the, you should see an effect on the Hubble parameter, but probably won't be as strong as the one that you see on the deceleration parameter for the reason that I mentioned, okay. There are more uh, effects coming into the game, into the play when you look at the deceleration parameter, just because you take another time derivative. Okay, so before taking the question by Mohammed, uh, I'd like to remind uh, you that uh, there have been many discussions uh, through the chatting window. And the last one by Jenny Wagner, uh, uh, actually, actually next to the last, seems to be the question relevant to you. Uh, either uh, Jenny Wagner, you can explain uh, verbally over this uh, microphone, or uh, Christos, you can read uh, the chatting. Uh, um, I would prefer to actually uh, listen to the question. Okay, but, yeah, so now uh, Jenny. Okay, Jenny then, then I I can jump in. Uh, okay. I was just I was just wondering that uh, when I take a look at the scale dependent flow uh, relative velocities, it seems to be similar to the paper by Pierre Fleury et al. from 2013, in which they explain that changing cosmological parameters due to inhomogeneity, inhomogeneities can also give you scale dependent parameters. And so I was wondering hmm. in how far could which, we which, tell which equation are you referring exactly? Are you referring to uh, this one? Yeah, the, the Q parameters. So you have hmm. a change 
a change in Q when you have a relative velocity between uh, your observer and your Hubble frame. Mm -hmm. This seems to be scale dependent. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the paper by Pierre Fleury et al, they have inhomogeneities and they say when they have inhomogeneities on small scales, like in the Swiss cheese model, then you can also bias your uh, cosmological parameters due to these inhomogeneities. And so I was wondering, can we tell these two scenarios apart from observations from our viewpoint? Mm, I'm not familiar with that paper, but uh, you get these scale dependence, this type of scale dependence uh, when you include inhomogeneities. For example, this is exactly the scale dependence that you get. This is exactly the scale dependence that leads you to the genes length. The only difference mm -hmm. there is that you deal with perturbations in the density here, you deal with uh, uh, kinematics. Mm -hmm. um, I have to look into it and uh, I'll let you know. Yeah, I that would be quite interesting. Right. Because uh, thanks I think very much for be, pointing out. I think there might be degeneracy between perturbations in the density and perturbations in the velocities. What do you mean by degeneracies? Um, that uh, you can mimic an effect of a velocity by perturbing your density. Mm, that's not impossible. Uh, I would think so, uh, in principle at least. I think this would be quite interesting to follow up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, by this time, uh, let me just encourage that uh, everybody uh, may uh, now ask to any uh, speakers uh, this session. But uh, let me uh, just ask uh, Mohamed. Uh, so you have Ramit, you have a question, right? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, well, uh, to trigger a discussion. Um, so Christo said that even in a case when there is no, uh, you know, uh, Hubble uh, frame, um, two relatively moving observers. And uh, so that, that seems a simple enough system. I was wondering, can these two observers um, agree with each other by um, using these expressions that are usually used in, uh, in cosmology to correct to the CMB frame? So this, these are, uh, you know, one plus Z equals one plus Z uh, multiplied by one, uh, where the Zs are all different. Uh, one stands for the cosmological redshift due to the underlying scale factor evolution. The other one is due to the relative motion of the observer with respect to this frame and the relative motion of, of let's say, the source with respect to the frame. So if you now turn one of the sources into an observer and have some way of communicating between them, will they both agree with each other using this purely special relativistic correction? Uh, assuming that there is a CMB frame, uh, so there is a reference frame for the universe and that the, these observers know the velocity that they have relative to that, yes, at the end, they can do the analysis and, and agree. But uh, assuming that they do just a local measurement uh, and they have nothing to, they know nothing about a reference frame, they just measure the, compare them local measurements, they will probably disagree. And they can disagree actually by large. <laughs> okay, because this, um, for example, the Rahman, so I think Wahidur Rahman is all collect, connected to this call and, uh, they recently have, uh, you know, so yeah, the, the theoretical uh, validity of these expressions used to correct data is, I think, important to the question of whether one should correct date, correct the data for anisotropy before looking for anisotropy. Uh, uh, I, I, I would agree with that. I think I would agree with that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, it may be better, uh, Christos, now you only share the screen because yep, now yep, it may be yep. a question to everybody. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. That. And uh, so any comments or questions? Uh, please go ahead. Okay, so David uh, Parkinson. So uh, I have a question for Dominic. Okay. So, um, Dominic, thank you very much for that, that nice talk. Um, LOFAR operates at a much lower frequency than uh, something like ASCAP or um, do you have, although you say you have no problems with, um, with dust or with stars, do you, are there other foregrounds that are giving you problems? Do you have any issues with the ionosphere? Um, we don't think so. We, we think, I mean, it took us quite a while to, to understand how to deal with ionospheric fluctuations and so on. So, so maybe for, for the non-radio astronomy people, I have to explain that uh, 
what the atmosphere is for optical astronomy is the ionosphere for radio astronomy, of course. And uh, similar to, to the effect of seeing in, in the optical uh, frequencies, you get uh, a kind of a smearing out and blurring of images just by, by the, the plasma that we have in the Earth's ionospheres. Um, and of course, this effect becomes worse the deeper you go in frequency. Um, and the reason why at the moment we can do even go below the, the so, so the lots is, is at uh, 140 megahertz, basically, uh, whereas this lores is at 54 megahertz and the uh, lots, the, the decameter survey, that's even at, at uh, about 20 megahertz. So that's only possible to do right now because we are in close to the minimum of the solar cycle. As soon as the solar cycle will come up again, uh, the sun will be more active. Uh, we will be basically blind uh, in that frequency again. Um, but so we, we have uh, developed quite uh, sophisticated techniques uh, how to do the calibration uh, due to the ionosphere. And we think this is uh, now working. Yeah, we are, we are still testing, and I'm, I, we are far away from claiming that we can do anything at percent level, right? Um, I mean, for individual sources, certainly not, right? We uh, typically individual measurements. If you just want to know what is the individual flux of that source, if you if you have a measurement at twenty percent, that's already fantastic, right? Uh, so you really have to do the statistics and you, you have to um, obtain accuracy via large numbers, so to say. Uh, on the other hand, that also gives you a chance to unveil uh, all kinds of potential systematics. So uh, this is what, what bugs us mostly at the moment still. So we are we're preparing a, a suite of cosmology papers on, on this DR2 data release. And we are still uh, in the process of, of trying to understand all of the uh, systematic issues we have. Um, so there's still a way to go, but, but I think we are, I don't think it's impossible to, to control the ionosphere. Okay, so if, if this kind of survey is only possible during the solar minimum, then it wouldn't be possible, say, in 10 years' time when we have SK low operating. Yeah, we should not start this survey at the start of SK low. But yeah. on the other hand, that's maybe good because we, it first takes anyhow five years to understand <laughs> the instrument, I guess, right? Yeah. So <laughs> by the time we have understood SK low, we should be ready to also. Uh, do that with SKLO, I guess. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. Okay, so any okay, Jenny Waguno? Yes, I would have a question for Roy. So this morning Dragon Hatterer told us that uh, we have non-vanishing dipoles, multipole um, octopoles and quadrupoles in the CMB. And um, it seems that we even have anomalies in that. And he argued that anomalies do not necessarily mean that we have to rule out lambda CDM. On the other hand, you showed today that we have a sufficient condition to rule, uh, to, to rule for lambda CDM when we have vanishing multiples. So these many slow multiples vanish. So I'm wondering now that we have these multiples, would you rule out lambda CDM? Provocatively thought. Oh, we cannot hear. Roy, you're mu muted. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Technologically challenged. Uh, no, thanks for the question, Jenny. Uh, the result I presented was an exact result. It's kind of an idealized situation. So it simply asks, <clears throat> what is the best basis that we have for observational evidence, if you like, for um, an almost Robertson Walker universe? So as I, as I explained, if we ask for exact 
Robertson Walker, that result tells us that the first three dipole, octopole, quadrupole, their vanishing is sufficient to give us exact homogeneity with the Copernican principle. And then one would expect that it's physically reasonable to extend that to a perturbative statement that if the CMB is almost isotropic, so that it has a small dipole, octopole, and quadrupole, or extending that has small multipoles, then the universe is likely to be close to Robertson Walker. So the, the, the alignments that the Dragon was talking about, and unfortunately I was asleep when he was talking, but these alignments were also mentioned, say, in, in um, Dominic's talk. And the peculiar thing about them is not their great size, it's just their, their alignments to each other. They're still perturbative, they're still small. So the fact that you have small octopole and quadrupole, which are aligned in strange ways, does not um, contradict what I was saying. And my result is much more limited. And, and I pointed out that we don't really know that, that the perturbative version of my result actually holds, but we kind of expect it should hold with some caveats. It's a reasonable, physically reasonable extension. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the clarification. Dominic uh, Schultz. Yeah, I mean, it's on the same issue because actually I think it, it's quite curious that one of these CMB anomalies that we have is that the two-point correlation function at larger 60 degrees is almost zero. And 60 degrees, this is what the octopole typically the scale of the octopole is 90 degrees is the quadrupole and 180 degrees is the, is the dipole. Um, and of course, the if you measure in multiple moments, then the quadrupole is indeed low. Um, the octopole seems to be quite okay with, with, the, with the expectation of lambda contact matter. But I was wondering whether this smallness of, of the two-point correlation function should could actually be in in the way how Roy presented it be an indication that we indeed live in the Robertson Walker universe. I mean th this is a bit uh, interesting coincidence I would say right yeah it is I hadn't actually thought of that before yes yeah me neither me neither <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew your your paper, but I never thought about it. Only That's today. <laughs> I suppose okay. the, the other the other aspects, Dominic, just while you're mentioning it, which which I think would be in principle interesting, is if we could test these anomalies in the matter distribution. Yeah, and sure. That's probably very futuristic because we're already struggling to to get uh, any kind of measurement with a dipole that looks reasonable. But in the future. Once we've tied down the dipole and assuming that lambda CDM in some form still survives, then we could try to see whether the CMB anom anomalies are repeated in the matter. And if they are, when it kind of would suggest that they're real. And if they aren't, it would kind of suggest they're statistical. So. Okay, so Mohamed Ramiz. Hi, uh, so it's actually maybe a question to both uh, Dominic and uh, Professor Martins. Uh, uh, so with respect to what was um, um, earlier said that uh, uh, the three-dimensional effect on the, on the dipole um, needs to be taken into account for a consistent study, but in your opinion is, uh, and, and I agree with that, uh, but uh, in your opinion, is that something within the FLRW assumption or is it something beyond because it, it would appear that that would make, for example, all matter within a shell around us, which uh, extends out to billions of light years, which one would think is then cosmological, move in a direction. And that, that doesn't really change on human time scales because under perturbation theory, you can see how fast these peculiar velocities will evolve and it's very slow. So it would mean that for all of our, you know, period of which, which we are taking cosmological data, we're seeing a locally anisotropic universe. So then is it justifiable to keep using um, the FLRW assumption to claim dark energy exists uh, and that it's consistent and all of that um, once you have a three-dimensional dipole? 
I'm not sure if I understand your question properly, Mohammed, but if you look at the dipole in a redshift bin, say at redshift one, and then yeah. you look in another redshift bin at redshift two, you would expect in a perturbed lambda CDM universe to have the same direction in the dipole, but a different amplitude. Sure. And there would be nothing, nothing um, violating basic assumptions of perturbed Robertson Walker cosmology in that. Yeah, but um, so it would be different in different redshifts because matter uh, is clustering differently in different redshifts, right? It would be different in different redshifts because you're measuring it against a different background. So if you went to very low redshifts, you would get strong contamination from nonlinear effects. You went to high redshifts, you get closer to the CMB dipole. But it's just another way of seeing the same. All you're seeing is relative motion. This is in the standard scenario, assuming that there isn't some breakdown. But if standard cosmology holds, then you're just measuring your kinematic relative motion against a different background at higher and higher redshift. That's what we're also doing in NVSS, except we're just collapsing all the redshifts into, into one. So the only point is that we could also do it in other galaxy redshift surveys tom tomographically as an additional check. Uh, uh, so I wasn't actually saying there's something wrong with collapsing everything. It's just that one can go further than that and do a cross-check, a complementary test. Yeah, but, but my question is very simple. You do that uh, complementary test and you, you conclude that all the anisotropy is at, let's say, lower redshift, say 0 0.08, right? That's about 400 megaparsecs. Um, now, is it justifiable to keep using a, an exactly isotropic homogeneous solution uh, to model the universe even on those scales? Um, um, once you have that conclusion as a feature of reality, in your opinion. So again, I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly. The, the theoretical prediction tells you how that redshift, how that dipole's amplitude should change with redshift. If you know the magnification bias and the evolution bias of your galaxy sample, in other words, if you have accurate measurements of your luminosity function, and if you are living in a standard universe, then you should confirm the prediction within the errors. But if you go to small enough redshifts, then the linear perturbation theory you've used starts to break down. How small are the linear effects? You're talking about? Sorry, I didn't hear that last question. Uh, you said small enough redshifts, but how small? Like, if I wanted well, this to... Is, this is a thing which, which is difficult to answer, but so as, as Dominic mentioned, in our forecasts for the SKA dipole, we removed redshifts less than between 0.3 and 0.5. So that that's safe. I mean, simulations indicate that that's definitely safe enough to get rid of the contamination, significant contamination from nonlinear effects on the structure dipole that we call. And that, that's, that doesn't challenge lambda CDM. I mean, if that redshift was one or two, then you'd be saying that you've got massive nonlinear effects out to reach of one and two. That that would definitely be a challenge. Okay, Tamina, you have anything to add? Any comments to add? No, maybe maybe what I could add is that um, maybe what we can also do is we can cross correlate surveys, right? Um, we can, for instance, uh, so, so what we are currently also doing in, in LOFA is we are cross-correlating EBOS with uh, the LOT survey, which allows you to also get an extra handle on the redshift distribution. And uh, because you know the redshift distribution of the EBOS uh, stuff, and then in the cross-correlation, then you automatically get a handle on the redshift of the radio stuff, right? Um, so we did not use that for the dipole yet because the, the field of view or, or the, the, the sky coverage is not yet enough to really properly do this. But I guess eventually we will be able to do that. And that should be maybe one of the first things we can do in the direction that, that you propose with this uh, 
And then, of course, also with, with photo sets, right? I mean, photo sets, of course, is always complicated to get, um, to have all the multi frequency samples that really cover large enough sky areas. Um, that, I mean, you have excellent multi frequency samples in deep fields, but in on the wide survey to really get photo sets on, on, on millions of objects is a real challenge. Okay. So any further comments or questions? I remember that uh, yesterday on the first day uh, the discussion uh, session went very long, but uh, maybe uh, not to make the audiences too tired, maybe better to uh, today uh, to keep on time, but we could have one or two, a uh, couple of more uh, questions or discussions, if, if any. Maybe I would like to bring up Good. another issue. Okay. Um, so um, Tamara mentioned already as, as a comment on, on Ashok's talk that um, these heliocentric redshifts are quite important. Um, so I, I, if, if you allow me to show one more slide, because I wanted to actually yeah, show please. my talk, but I ran out of time. Um, we. Yeah, you can share the screen. Yes, we actually looked into that question with the supernova. Um, and we took a sample of supernova that, uh, so we took the Pantheon data set and there is a improved uh, sample uh, where, where Charles Steinhardt and his students, they improved and fixed certain inconsistencies in the data set with the heliocentric redshifts. We took that, we further fixed a few coordinates of supernova that were also mixed up in that data set and then fitted just the Hubble diagram in a three-dimensional way that we said, let's not assume that we know what the CMB uh, direction is. Let's just see whether the supernova data, if we just take them as observed. So we take the heliocentric redshifts, we take the observed magnitudes, and then we fit just a direction dependent uh, Hubble law that kind of um, includes all the peculiar velocity effects. And we take the peculiar velocities into account via the expected covariance not by correcting for peculiar velocities, because correcting for peculiar velocities means you assume already a cosmic reg, uh, rest frame. And then this is what we find. Uh, so we will hopefully put this on the archive by the end of the week or so. So we can recover. Here you see the declination and right ascension. So these purple lines are the CMB directions. So you recover, of course, the dipole. And this is the velocity that we recover. So we recover a smaller velocity than the um, uh, Planck velocity. And uh, so I found this quite interesting that once after you do these corrections that Tamara was pointing out, um, you do find a result which is kind of um, in better agreement. But on the other hand, you also find that the dipole, that the solar motion should be smaller than actually uh, inferred from the CMB. Okay, uh, thank you for the interesting comments, Dominic. And uh, if there is any other uh, uh, questions, I don't see. If there is no more uh, questions at this moment, maybe uh, let's thank all the speakers this session uh, who gave us very uh, interesting and, and those inspiring talks. And uh, I hope uh, we see everybody tomorrow again. Okay, so this is the official closing of the session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ah, sorry, Ovina woman, I uh, I missed your uh, the uh, final uh, raising hand. Sorry about that.
Okay, okay, no problem. <laughs> so maybe yeah. I hope you can just ask, uh, so we have uh, still tomorrow and the Thursday. I hope there is a uh, chance that uh, you can ask. Yeah, yeah, there, 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 no, there, there's no, no problem at all. I wanted okay. to ask Roy, um, because there was a slide he missed, he couldn't get to. I wanted to see if we uh, could have maybe a minute or two to discuss them. I see. Okay. I hope, I mean, the, uh, you could, uh, I mean, the, so uh, I guess if he attends, um, the, there's a way uh, to communicate through the chatting window, uh, many ways, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, okay. I will speak to him. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, sorry again for my, uh, so I just, uh, uh overlooked, uh, yes. No, no, it's fine. No problem. Thanks. Hello, Bumun. Okay. Thank you very much for hosting, uh, for chairing, Bumun. Oh, uh, okay. So my pleasure. I enjoyed myself uh, all the presentation and uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. Yeah. So yeah. you are doing very good. Uh, uh, you organize very good workshop, very interesting workshop. So I heard many, some scattered talks, but I haven't had any such many series of talks all related to the uh, common directions and uh, you know so it was it was a very good opportunity for me so the only thing is that i was occupied with many other things so i had to miss some of the interesting talks mm -hmm. but uh, so i hope i can uh, later uh, through the uh, video since you are recording yeah. so i guess i can uh, learn more yeah that's great okay okay uh, thanks for your it, nice job Okay, okay. see you, you tomorrow. Much. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll close the I'll close the room now. Thanks a lot. Okay, you're close. Okay, so